All right, everyone. Hello. I am Alex. Good to see you all. Um, all right. We're going to be doing a uh, Disneyland Railroad Steam Locomotive Simulator. So this was created by Preston Naratisai, and, um, and it's a really cool game. Um, and it's, I would say it is the most accurate Steam Locomotive Simulator you can get right now and the links for how you can get it are in the description of the video um so <clears throat> i'm gonna say hello to a few people and then we'll be we'll begin so let me see hold on move this to full screen and i'll go to my comments on my phone here we go <clears throat> so we have techno blade here hello we have little gamer chicken sandwich daniel is here Hello, everybody. All right, so let's see. That was a funny commercial that was just on my phone. This cable is going to bother me. <clears throat> there we go. All right, so I'm just making sure I have the correct settings on here for running this. OK, cool. Now. Uh, we'll do Disneyland 1956-57 because it looks good. So I know some of you tuned in yesterday to <laughs> to watch this because I did do this yesterday. And uh, that didn't end up very well because I was having a lot of technical difficulties. Let me lower this down here. Um, yeah, a lot of technical difficulties. So I was able to, after the live stream yesterday, I was able to figure it out. That's why I deleted the live stream soon after I did it, because it was pointless. It was like just, you know, I, I wasted all this time trying to figure out what was going on that I couldn't fix. So we'll go ahead and do this. I don't know why I'm opening the windows. I just feel like it. All right, so we're going to start this engine from cold. This means literally having to completely, you know, but I'll give you kind of a... Oh, hold on. Here's a full view of the train. So it's the number one CK holiday at Disneyland. <clears throat> it, uh, Contrary to what some people might believe, it really is an authentic steam locomotive. It's just miniature scale. It's five-eighths of real size. Um, but yes, it is quite a beautiful engine. And uh, they have a second engine, the EP Ripley as well. Uh, but just for the sake of making this speedy we'll just use this engine <clears throat> so uh granny gaming says what kind of game is this this is a railroad simulator all right so we are at cold that seems weird okay cool <clears throat> now the first thing we got to do is we got to get the fire going. So the way that we do that is we will have to hook up a, an umbilical. So there is currently, if I move this, you can see the boiler gauge right here. Um, it is currently reading zero pressure in the boiler. That means there's water in the boiler, but there's no steam pressure. In fact, let's get a look at how much water there is because this is important for us. So this knob I'm turning allows air or sometimes steam if the if the locomotive is running steam will be let into this pipe that goes into this glass. <coughs> this knob which I just opened lets water from the water level of the boiler into the glass. So this sight glass, it's not a water level glass, it's a sight glass so you can see where the water level is. Um this <laughs> This water is too low. We need it to be at least one nut in height. That way, um, that way the water is. Let me remove this. That way the water is at a high enough level all the way across. We want the water to be almost just below this level of the boiler. So, there. I found out there is a way to do this. Let's see. We're gonna increase the water quantity in the boiler. That's too much. Five nine, two five seven. It was just at two five seven. Here we'll give it 
that much. That's that's about as much as you probably see when you come in in the morning. So there we go. That literally reads the level of the water in the boiler, not the quantity of water in the boiler. All right, so what just happened? Did I did I touch something? I must have moved it. We'll call it 236. Okay. So, now... I'll show you how we hook up the umbilical. Go to setup. Now, because there's no steam pressure in the boiler and there's no... Um, there's Because there's no steam pressure in the boiler, we can't spray the fuel into the boiler. This is an oil-fired steam locomotive, and we need to be able to spray the fuel into the firebox, ignite it, and that's what creates the heat that boils the water. Well, without steam pressure, we can't spray that, so we need to use air. So we're going to click this button here, compressed air umbilical, and on, you see all of a sudden a hose appears. This is the air compressor, and it's forcing air directly into um, the, eh, what would we call it? I guess this is the blower. Yeah, this is the blower line. But the blower line extends from the cab of the locomotive all the way to the front of the locomotive, and it creates a draft that goes up the, um, the stack of the locomotive. Now, I'm going to open this valve here to let the air from the umbilical into the locomotive, and now we'll have to return inside. Uh, okay, so all the valves in this locomotive are completely shut. So that means that there, even though I opened the valve down there, there's no air entering the engine itself. So the way we do that is, um, well, I'll give you kind of the shortcut. This red knob here controls, hold on. There we go. This red knob here controls what's called the steam manifold. That's this thing right here that controls the most important appliances of the locomotive. Um, so the way that we allow the air pressure to work is we don't want the air to go into the boiler. That's not what we want it to do. Instead, we just want it, the air to run the appliances. So we're not going to open this yet. What we are going to do is we're going to open this valve, which is the atomizer. That's the thing that sprays the the fuel into the firebox. We're going to open this one on the other side, which is the blower valve. That will allow us to actually blow air up the stack. So, now that we got that, we're going to open the firebox door. And I remember how to do this. You got to make sure the menu is turned off in order to do this. And the activation for the door, I don't know why, is way up here. Maybe it just makes it easier for the user. But right click to unlock it, use your left click to pull it open. That is the firebox door. Now, I am going to go ahead and, and light this locomotive. So we need this thing open. Now, this here is for the fuel. I'm gonna at this moment, it doesn't really matter how far I pull it back. It just needs to be pulled back. Now I'm going to pull this valve right here. This center one opens the atomizer. I don't hear the atomizer. It should be working. Whoa, jeez. There we go. So... So the way I did that, and I'm going to have to adjust this, I need to, I'm looking through this window to see the smoke. I need to adjust the, the fuel level. So I'm listening very carefully to how it sounds. We want enough air spraying with the fuel to prevent this this smoke from coming out. The more air we introduce, the less smoke there will be, but if you introduce too much air, it'll start sputtering. Come on. Maybe if I increase the, the blower. 
Come on. Come on. Gosh, it's been such a long time since I've done this. We don't want all this smoke. When it when it's an oil fired locomotive. When it's an oil fired locomotive, we want the thing to okay. Something is wrong. Too much oil, I think. Come on. All right, you know what I'm gonna do? <laughs> I'm gonna let the fireman do this. He'll fix that for us, I think. Oh, he blew out the fire. Wonderful. There we go. Alright, so that what I just did was I activated the automatic fireman, so it replicates there being a, a person sitting in the other seat operating the fire. That is rather loud. Um, Cowcatcher says, yes. Uh, well, Cowcatcher says, are these, these engines are oil fired? Yes. Um, the ones on the Disneyland Railroad are oil fired. So the firemen, you can see the knob turning, that's not me. But those knobs are turning, that's the firemen adjusting those. So it's really tricky um, to do this. You, you do need to know exactly what you're doing. I'll go ahead and show you inside the firebox since we gotta close this door anyway. So he's adjusting the fire. I think he's doing a very bad job of it. I think that fire's about to go out. Do I have to do this myself? Yeah, that fire is going out. I don't think he knows what he's doing. Go ahead and light this again. Come on. I don't hear the fire. It's a balancing act, you guys. It's a balancing act. I'm slowly inching the um, the fuel open. You see this red glow? We want that to be an amber color, not red. But I also need the fire to be bigger. So I'm slowly adjusting both the atomizer and the fuel. So as I open up the fuel, I'll need to open up the atomizer. And we want, we want, if we see any glow coming around here, we want to see an amber colored glow, which I do faintly see an amber colored glow now. So, let's see, that should be fine. We should be building up heat now. The fire could be larger. We see, I can see the glow all the way down here. That's a little red now. I'm going to open this a bit more. Just a, just a hair, because we need the fire to have a very specific look to it. You see, I still think that the fire could be bigger. So, 
fire is going. We just need the heat to build up. Oh, there's the compressor over there <laughs> next to the tracks. All right, so I'll answer some questions as we wait for the for the heat to build up. says, hey Alex, do you know what kind of oil is used in the Dijon locomotives, e.g. bunker oil, youth cooking oil? They use what's called B98 number two biodiesel. And what that is, is it's a biodiesel made from the cooking oil that is used around the park. Now in 1955, like what this game is designed to, to be like, or this is 1957 technically, but you get the idea. This is early days of Disneyland. In the early days, they used number two diesel oil as their as their oil for burning. Um, now today, they use B98 number two biodiesel. And so what that is, is they take the used cooking oil from around the park, they send it to a plant that will process it. They'll add about 2% of the weight of the oil. 2% um, of that is diesel fuel. That helps to make it more combustible. So. 98% of it is is cooking oil that's been refined. So it's kind of cool. They get to kind of use up the cooking oil. And it is a little healthier for the environment when you burn it cor correctly at the right amount of the right amount of uh, air or steam and the right amount of uh, fuel, you will have basically no smoke coming out of the stack. You can actually see right now the fire is burning, but there's little to no smoke at all coming out the stack. And that's because I'm burning the fuel very cleanly, which is exactly what you want. So when people go to Disneyland, they often don't realize that the locomotives are real because they expect to see smoke coming out of the engine. But uh, but it burns so clean, you, you actually don't want that. Well, oh, geez, what now? The fire just went out. Am I... What in the world? Oh, I forgot. Come on. So to light the fire, you need to have the firebox door open. What in the... it is sometimes the compressor it gives an uneven pressure so I think that because it's an uneven pressure it's causing that that rippling thunderous sound you're hearing the thunderous sound is the fire but but it's it's going in and out because the air pressure is not consistent That, that red glow, we want that amber colored. So I'm slowly opening up the atomizer to let more air into the fire or fuel mixture. But what that's doing is it's making the flame go down. It's so weird, I don't understand. You're supposed to keep an amber color, not a red color. But that's, if I have it at this level, the fire's nice and big. It's just weird. But there's no smoke coming out the stack, which means that it is burning cleanly. It's just red. And actually, you know what? Maybe red is the color. Because it's it's burning cleanly, and it's not overly, the, 
the thunderous noise isn't overpowering. It, so it is, it does sound normal. So guys, maybe red is the color. That's strange. I could have sworn it was supposed to be amber. But it's working. Alright. Oh, right. I need to read the, the, fuel, the um, steam pressure in the boiler. So here's the... Hold on. This is the steam gauge right here. It's reading zero. And I forgot. This valve opens up the boiler pressure to the steam gauge. So by opening that... Actually, just close it, I think. Yeah, that's open. There we go. Alright, well, I guess we really do have zero pressure in the boiler. <clears throat> we can't start operating the appliances till the pressure reads about 75. says reduce the atomizer till the booming stops. I trust Ite because he actually knows this stuff very well. Aha! He's right. I had too much atomizer going. There's the amber color we want. How's the smoke? Still clean. Wonder what the fire looks like then. Oh yeah, that's a nice big roaring fire. Thank you, Ite. That's exactly what we want. I think I can even reduce the atomizer just a teensy weensy bit more too. Get that amber color we want. There we go. Alright, so... <laughs> Thanks, Ite. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Julia says, could a steam train be transported by an ocean liner? Yeah, yeah, it's, been ha it's happened before. Um, but that's how a lot of um, companies that built steam locomotives in you know, in like the United States or Europe or whatever, they could they could move the trains over um, if they needed to for some reason. Because there there were like for instance, there were American locomotives that were built in the U.S. and during the war they transported them over overseas to um, France. But uh, granted, they probably did that by by military ship. But yes, there there were. Uh, there were ocean liners that did transport trains and locomotives and things. Uh, one of them comes to mind. Uh, the SS Rex. The SS Rex uh, the from the Italian line did transport a steam locomotive, if I remember correctly. And it was put on its... They built these, these decks on the back to help support the weight of the of the locomotive and so it sat on the stern. Uh, okay, so yes folks, I am starting from zero pressure, so that way uh, I can show you how to build it up. Now I'm not that concerned at the moment that that we don't really see any pressure building. That's because first we gotta get the boiler hot. The boiler is cold. So this fire is warming it up. It'll take a while. It'll take a while before the steam pressure starts building. That's why it takes so long. This game does accelerate the process a bit. So you know it could take anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes to an hour to actually build up the steam pressure. 
So while we're doing that, what I'll do is we'll kind of play with the settings here. So we're on number one CK holiday. whistle switched off because CK Holiday is a single chime. I do like having, see these pilot flags, they're green. We're about to switch them to American pilot flags. There you go. Oh, let's, uh, for authenticity's sake, let's show the oil can. There it is, just popped into view. I don't like the armrest cushions. These are the armrest cushions. Um, so they, they, you know, they're armrest positions, so they don't really need much explanation. I don't really like them there. I just keep them turned off. I don't need any of those things done. We could check the water level in the tender, and we can check the fuel level in the tender. This locomotive does operate with a steam air compressor. So the brakes use steam uh, use air pressure to apply the brakes to the locomotive. I know that might be strange to some train fans that are, you know, modern train fans. They say, wait, wait, no, brakes are applied when you remove air from the system. Um, but uh, on this system, this is what's called a direct line braking system. This means that um, for these old locomotives, you have to add air pressure to the system to apply the brakes. Um, but anyway, we do need to open the air compressor tanks. Or, yeah, well, first the exhaust line, the supply line. I'll open the rear air tank drain. Uh, because when you compress air, it can create, it can create water bubbles. Like not but water bubbles, water droplets in the in the tanks, and so I'm gonna let those drain. Uh, so this handle right here. Oh, by the way, if you guys like to use the flashlight feature, which is the one I'm turning off and on now, that's just F on your keyboard for flashlight. So um, it helps a lot when you're in a dark space. This handle here is the cylinder cocks, which are the little valves at the bottom of the cylinder. Um, I think if I open it like this, the, yep, there we go. Yep, that, oh, see the water draining out of the cylinders? That's good because when the engine um, gets cool, whatever steam is in the cylinders at that time will condense to water eventually as, it, as the cylinder cools. Water is not compressible, so when the cylinder is operating, the last thing you want is water going, moving through the cylinder. You, you could blow the cylinder. So we open the cylinder cocks to let the water drain, and we'll leave that open, even all the way until we start moving. We'll leave that open. Okay, so let me just check the settings on this thing. Settings are fine. Okay, we can move that. Still no boiler pressure, but again, the engine is still heating up. Um, all right, we don't have anything ready yet. So at the moment, there's not really anything to do. So what I will do is I'll move us out here, get us a closer look at this engine. See if we can see some of the water draining from the cylinder pumps. Oh, there's some water on the other side. Yeah. Nothing. 
All right, well, I'll teach you some parts of the locomotive. So, you guys might wonder what these domes are sitting on the top of the locomotive. So, this dome here with the number one on it, sorry, this is the sand dome. They carry beach sand on the locomotives. Even to this day, modern diesel electric engines still use beach sand. What they use that for, you can see the pipe that runs down to the wheel there. That beach sand is used to provide traction on particularly slippery rails. This could be during rainy weather, icy weather, snowy weather, um, or even if the rails for some reason have an excess amount of oil on them from just oil and lubrication dripping from the engine. Um, so sometimes the rails can become quite slippery, and so steam locomotives and modern diesel trains, they carry beach sand. Why beach sand, you ask? Why not desert sand? Beach sand is some of the smallest grain, softest sand there is. And because it's the grains are so small, it is less likely to cause pitting in the wheels of the engine. Because, as you can imagine, you got these smooth steel wheels rolling over something hard like rock, even though it's the size of sand grains, you can cause pits to happen. So that is less likely when, um, when you have beach sand, because it's a smaller grain. So the second dome, this is the steam dome. So it's exactly as it sounds. The, the boiler creates the steam, the steam rises. That's why you have this tapered look to the boiler. That's why the boiler is higher on the back end than it is on the front end. The steam rises and goes up into this dome. And that's where the steam collects. And that's where the intake for the steam cylinders is. So when you pull back on the throttle, you open the intake inside this dome. The steam from inside the dome rushes through the intake and then goes down into the cylinders. They, they are, um, it's split using a pipe and it splits between the two cylinders and allows steam into them. So on top of the steam dome, these two black knobs, whatever you want to call them, those are um, those are what are called uh, the pop valves. So each of those control the excess pressure inside the locomotive. We can actually set the pressure. This locomotive um, in this game operates at 125 psi, which means that once you reach 125 psi, that is perfect for for normal train operations. If it exceeds 150 psi, um, the, one of the pop valves will open. If it exceeds 160 psi, the second pop valve will open. And with two pop valves draining the boiler of steam, uh, it should prevent an explosion. And behind the pop valves is the steam whistle. I can hear the Mark Twain. Now the steam whistle, if I remember correctly, this is a single chime Luckenheimer, or at least a replica. So it's a small, small one, operates on steam. You have the bell. The bell on a locomotive, at least, at least in terms of a steam locomotive from the old days, was used to indicate when a locomotive was crossing a grade, was going around a, a blind corner, um, and also when approaching a station. So, yeah. And I believe they still use it for that purpose today on modern trains. Um, this in the front is often called a cow catcher. And that's not really accurate. What this is really called is a pilot. So when people say cow catcher, it's actually an extremely inaccurate term <laughs> uh, to the point where a lot of train enthusiasts will laugh if you call it a cow catcher. Because that's not at all what its purpose is for. Um, it's designed to clear debris and things from the tracks. Um, and technically, <laughs> so people would say, well, aren't, aren't cows considered debris when they're kind of walking over the tracks? Yes, kind of, except that in the olden days, they wouldn't have just run over the cows. 
I mean, first of all, running over a cow would have destroyed this wooden cow catcher, because it is made of wood. Um, so what they would have done if they encountered cows was they would have brought the train to a stop and blown the whistle a lot to kind of clear the cows out of the way, but they wouldn't have run over the cows. You would have had to deal with a lot of legal issues if you did that, because obviously there, somebody owned the cows that you're running over. So, um, so no, it's not called a cow catcher, it's called a pilot. And the wheels behind the pilot are called the pilot wheels. So the pilot wheels are, they're on an assembly of their own. It's two axles, obviously, but it's on an assembly of its own called a bogey. The pilot wheels on these trains are designed to help the train steer around curves. Because if the train only had these four wheels, you know, imagine you're going around a curve and maybe as you're going, the wheels want to catch on the curb as it's making a right turn. So it's constantly shifting left and then going right, shifting left and then going right. So the pilot wheels help guide the locomotive around the turn. And then you have the drivers. That's what these wheels are called because they are the driving force of the locomotive. The drivers are hooked up with this... Um, uh, you can call them connecting rods, but they're also called driving rods. And the driving rods are connected to the cylinder piston, or the piston rod. Oh, hold on. The piston rod is right there in the center. And it's hooked up to that brass bearing. And then that goes in and out of the cylinder. So, yes. And then we have the eccentrics. Did he model the eccentrics? I forget. Let's see. I don't see them. Yeah, he didn't model the eccentrics, but what keeps the train going back and uh, either going forward or reverse, sorry, either going forward or reverse are the eccentrics. They're kind, they kind of look like, like cylinder pistons, except without the cylinder. Um, but they kind of, the way that they're, uh, the the way that they're arranged. You can adjust them to make the train go forward, or you can adjust them backwards to make the train go in reverse. Eccentrics are really difficult to explain, at least for me to explain. Now you have the tender. The tender holds the fuel and the water for the steam engine. So I can actually show you on the Disneyland Railroad. To the left, this lower area that's kind of in a horseshoe curve around the center tank, this is the water, accessible by that green water hatch. So that holds the water, and then this box in the center holds the fuel. So that is the fuel. Once again, for the Disneyland trains, it used to be diesel, and then uh, in since 2007, it's been B98 number two biodiesel, which is made from the used cooking oil around the parks. It, they don't literally blow used cooking oil into the engine. It's refined, but it is made from the cooking oil, and it burns very cleanly. Hello, Mateo. Good to see you. All right, so folks, the CK Holiday usually pulls the freight train. Let me see if I can... Where is it? Train. Aha. That's the freight train the CK Holiday usually pulls. And it's got three cattle cars, two gondola cars, and one caboose. Let's see, I'll move that. So the cattle cars hold cattle. The gondolas, or gondolas actually is how you should say it for trains, gondolas, uh, they can hold pretty much anything that's kind of loose, like rocks, iron ore, um, scrap steel, anything like that, anything that's loose. And then you have the caboose. The caboose, I don't, personally think is modeled very well in this game, but, you know, it is what it is, and it's there, so at least it's there. Um, but uh, the caboose was for uh, doing for... Uh, it allowed the conductor of the freight train to use it kind of as an office. They kind of, you know, they did their, their paperwork and stuff in there. Um, this particular caboose, this very specific one, was designed to also hold a lot of train crew because there would have been um, people like what are called, uh, oh, by the way, the cars that you hear, that's the five freeway. So you're hearing the cars from the five freeway. Um,
Which is accurate, because when you're in Disneyland, you can hear the five freeway. Um, so you would have had what are called brake men. They would have climb, climbed around on top of the cars of the train, applying the brakes whenever the, uh, whenever the engineer would sound it. But at Disneyland, they use air brakes. Um, so they don't need brake men. But that's what the caboose, this particular caboose is for, is for brake men. And, of course, the back probably would have had the office for the conductor. And the cupola on the top of the of the, uh, the caboose was f for um, the train crew to be able to look out of the train and see it and, you know, look for smoke coming from the journals. The journals, if you're wondering, what are journals, Alex? Do I have a flashlight? No, I don't have a flashlight. Um, well, I don't know if you can see, there's a wheel there. And then right next to the wheel is this, uh, just jutting out from the wheel, is this little black box. And it's hard to see because it's so dark over here, and I don't have a flashlight to show you. But um, but those boxes are the journals. They hold a, um, a brass bearing. Today we use ball bearings, but before then they used a, a half ring brass bearing. And that box holds lubrication and a little sponge or a little rag. And when the, the rag picks up the lubricant and as the wheel turns, you can kind of see the journals better on uh, here. So this little black box here, you might even, oh yeah, you can say it says Lovestead Seattle. So that's, that's the company that actually built this. It was a real company, CM Lovestead of Seattle, Washington. So inside this box is a pool of lubricant at the bottom and a little rag that is touching the, um, the bearing and as the wheel turns, as the axle turns, it picks up lubricant from the rag and lubricates it constantly. If that lubricant runs out, the whole thing will overheat and could catch fire. In fact, they often did in the olden days. Um, metal ball bearings helped reduce the amount of times that happened, but it wasn't 100%. Uh, we need to check inside the locomotive right now to see where the where everything is at. Do I need to? I feel like we should see steam pressure. Ite, are you still here? Can you tell me if I'm doing something wrong where I can't see the steam pressure? I feel like there should be some by now, at least like one or something one pound per square inch or something. I'm opening this valve at the bottom just to make doubly sure that I have enough water in the boiler because, you know, with these engines, you could easily run out of water. If the water falls, if the water falls so low it's at the bottom of the water glass, that's really bad. You could, uh, you could, um, Oh, Ite says, no, you're okay. Okay, it just takes time, right? It just takes a lot of time for the pressure to, to start building. Okay. Ite says, you will hear a click sound when it starts to rise. Oh, right, the clicking from the expanding of the metal, right? You'll hear the expanding metal. All right, so while we're still waiting for that, because we still have things to do once the pressure does start building, and we can't do that stuff until the pressure does build. But we have enough water in the boiler. We're fine for now. I'll take you on kind of a little journey around the, the park as it is, as we let the pressure build. So, again, with this game, you know, you can run the uh, CK Holiday or the EP Ripley, and you can mix and match between the freight train and the um, passenger train. That's the passenger train. I didn't, I didn't even actually show you guys the passenger train. It's a six-car train. At the very front is the combine, which is combination baggage and passenger. And then you've got four regular passenger coaches after that. And at the very end, you have an observation car. Um, what makes it an observation car? Oh, he didn't model that. Okay, well, what makes it an observation car is on the real one, there... Um, there is railing that surrounds the back area, and the back area is like a porch where you can actually come out and 
you know, and there, you know, in the olden days, there would have been seats and things, and so, like, you know, the fancy people could come out and enjoy a view of the back of the train. And then, on the, on the Disneyland train, this wall here is recessed about a foot further in. It's not modeled here. I think he just kind of, he modeled five cars to look relatively the same, sorry. He modeled five cars look relatively the same, and the only difference is the combine, which he actually modeled. Um, yeah. So, um, if we turn around, we can kind of see what the backstage area would have looked like behind Frontierland. You have some 1950s cars parked there. Um, these two buildings, by the way, this, uh, this, what do you call it? Um, car barn and engine house along with this building here, used to be at Disneyland up until 2015 when they demolished it to make way for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. This building eventually became um, a paint shop for ride attractions. So like the ride vehicles would come in there, they get painted. Um, and then over here was a maintenance shop. So they actually turned the old Disneyland Railroad car barn and engine house into a ride vehicle repair facility. That's what it was up until 2015. You can hear the Mark Twain. All right, so let's kind of, uh, we, you can see we're on the backside of the Rivers of America. This is Disneyland supposedly 1956, 57. There are some discrepancies, but he did the best he could. You can see the burning cabin, which would have been around in 1950. Six, yeah, so that's accurate. 1956 was when the burning cabin showed up. Um, this is the track that goes around the rivers of America. You can kind of see the berm here. Now, the berm at Disneyland around this area, uh, in some areas, was around 30 feet tall. But I'm trying to think. Yeah, some of this is not 100% the way it was. Because this berm that we're looking at is not tall enough for how it would have been. But, uh, yeah, it was going to be 30 feet tall. Here's the switch track that leads to the roundhouse. Up until 2015, this, uh, yeah. Yeah, up until 2015, this tunnel, which led to the original roundhouse, was still at Disneyland. It was uh, boarded up in the style of an abandoned mine. Uh, but when they started building for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge and they needed to reroute the river... They destroyed the tunnel. Hello, Gray Starline. Now, um, this game is designed to make the park look good from the perspective of the tracks. So, when we're on the tracks, we can see Disneyland as it would have looked in 1956 slash 1957, but uh, there's no mine train through nature's wonderland, or as it would have been called, mine... Rainbow Caverns Mine Train in 1956. Um, it's not here, but it would have been. Um, but nevertheless, you know, if you if you go into um, let's see, from the perspective of the tracks, the park looks great. You know, that's Fantasyland over there. But the you will notice, folks. I don't want you to to be disappointed and think this is the whole Disneyland. He designed this because of the railroad, not because of the park. So. When you actually, oh, sorry. When you actually start going up in the air and you start wandering the park, you will notice that um, not everything is as it seems. So it's, the park is not completed. The central hub is not there. Yeah, when you move, the music gets kind of weird. So some of Tomorrowland is here. It's not completely modeled. You know, Main Street doesn't look all that accurate until you actually get to the area where the train sees it. So, let me go over here, actually. So, as you can see, this looks great. This looks really amazing. The, the Mickey is missing, but I think that might be due to copyright issues. Um, but it looks fantastic. And you see Main Street Station. It is modeled so well. It is really beautiful. And then, you know, City Hall looks really great. Most of Town Square looks really great. 
Um, but then when you leave Town Square and you go further down, you can see the, the detail decreases. And that's because from the train, you can't see it that well. So it doesn't really matter. Again, the person designed uh, Preston, he designed this um, because of the railroad, not because of the park. So I'm letting you guys kind of see that as it is. You know, you go to Frontierland, there's no Frontierland. There is the river. There is an operating Mark Twain steam riverboat. We'll take you to that right now. I can see the Mark Twain. There's the Mark Twain. See the paddle on the back actually turns and steam comes out the uh, exhaust stacks which are at the back of the of the boat, which is accurate. So, um, you know, it looks it looks really great, you know. And the Mark Twain, you, you've heard it in the game so far, it'll blow its whistle and stuff. So, and the Mark Twain is modeled nicely because again, you'll see it from the tracks as you go by. Sometimes you can do the shave and a haircut whistling that the two that the train and the Mark Twain will do. So if you whistle at it with a shave and a haircut, it'll whistle back with a shave and a haircut. Sometimes. It's it's not always uh you know. Uh, if you hear audio kind of, you know, glitching, it's because I'm moving. The audio glitches when you when you move too quickly. So, um, but if you're moving at a normal speed, it won't do that. So, pretty cool. Now, um, I'm going to position this camera here. So that way we can get a good look at the train coming out of the tunnel when we come back to this. Alright. Let's see. Yeah. So as you can see folks, it takes a long time to start up from from cold. hoping it, it goes soon because I only have like 40 minutes left. <laughs> so normally, so you might be wondering how long does it take for the engineers when they come into the park to get this thing running? Um, about three hours. So they come in, if the park opens at eight, then they'll start steaming the locomotive up at five. So, actually, they do it sooner than that because they do want it ready half an hour before the park opens for, you know, various testing and stuff. So, they'll come in about 4.30 um, and, okay, no, if you really want to be accurate, they'll come in at 3.30. They'll start um, doing, like, um, pre-checks. They'll, um, you know, inspect things like the wheels and whatever. Um, Gray Starling says, is Disneyland steam locomotive narrow gauge or standard gauge? It is narrow gauge, like Ute says. It's 36 inch gauge, which means that the tracks are three feet spaced apart by three feet, which is 36 inches. So it is a narrow gauge, but the engines, um, the engines are five eighths scale, which means they're miniature. So they're, they're, they're just over three quarters of real size. Um, and so they are miniature, so that way they look like they're standard gauge as they're on the tracks. Um, one of the ways you can, act, one of the interesting things you can see actually um, is the cab of the locomotive is square. Now, if you look at locomotives just like this in old fashioned pictures, the cab is not square. It's a elongated rectangular shape. And the reason why it's square is because in order to fit the the engineer and the fireman in this miniature train they had to raise the height of the cab and they made it a square shape and another way you can tell is that 
you look at, again, old photographs, the top of the cab is usually right here underneath the steam dome. That's the height. Um, but at Disneyland, it is way above the steam dome. And so, yeah, so the Disneyland trains are miniature scale. Again, that's five-eighths scale, which is just over three-quarters of full size. And they run on 36-inch narrow-gauge tracks. So, all right. Um... Head back into the thing. Does it move faster? But no, it doesn't. So, here's another cool thing. This is the speedometer. It measures in feet per second because the trains don't go fast enough for you to measure them in miles per hour. You know, if the train were to go 12 feet per second, that is approximately eight miles per hour. So it's not very fast. So measuring it by feet per second is a more accurate way to measure it rather than miles per hour. But uh, yeah, that speedometer is really good for that. We can also read this thing here, which exists there in real life. It says, Santa Fe and Disneyland Railroad, steam locomotive number one, CK Holiday. Operating pressure, 125 PSI, which is pounds per square inch, built by Walt Disney Enterprises, 1954 through 1955 in Burbank, California. And now it says the simulator information. So the simulator was made by Preston. Uh, he built it between 2014 and 2017 in Los Angeles. And his website, by the way, if you guys want to... Again, the link is in the description below, but the website is ckholidayplans.com. And there's a lot of... Sorry, I'm totally... Yeah. So there's a lot of really cool things about this simulator. Now, you don't have to start the engine from cold like I'm doing. I'm just showing you because some people ask me. But, um, but if you press F3, you get this menu. Set engine cold, which the boiler was at zero pressure. It was cold. Set external hookup, um, which is to configure everything so that way there's zero boiler pressure and no fire, but I do believe they hook it up with the um, air compressor just like we did manually. There's set engine warm, which is the engine is not running, but there's 50 pounds of pressure in the boiler and it's very warm. And the warm feature is important because at Disneyland, when the engineers come in at 3.30 in the morning to start their, their first, you know, opening checks, the engine is still hot from yesterday's use. You know, it's, it, it, it's all iron and steel, so it doesn't cool down so quickly overnight. It takes a while. So, um, especially with all the thick insulation covering the boiler. So the boiler still has 50 pounds of pressure in it just about, and it still has... Um, it still has a, a very hot temperature. So um, so when they come in, that's how, it, that's how the engines are. And so setting the engine to warm is replicating that. And then the final one is set ready to pull. This means that when you click that, the whole engine will be pretty much ready to go, except for a few minor things um, that you would need to do, such as operating the... Um, the lubricator. The lubricator keeps the um, keeps the air compressor from seizing up, and unfortunately, that is not part of the set ready to pull setup. So when you do set ready to pull, you will have to make sure that this is activated and done. You'll see me do this later if the pressure starts building. You'll see me do this later and how I set that up. And uh, yeah, so that's the menu features. Sometimes if you sit real still, you can see the needle moving. I almost feel like I do see the needle moving.
Hello, Ivan. I'm doing great. have any questions that I could answer? I know I've been answering a lot of stuff already, but... I can show you the bell ringing. With no pressure in the boiler, we can't operate the whistle, so it won't it won't whistle at all. But so, if we pull on the cord, we can make the bell ring. You can also make the bell ring by pressing B on your keyboard. That automatically rings the bell. So here's me pressing B. You can make the bell ring faster if you maintain a rhythm by pressing B. Same thing when you pull the cable. So it's not a consistent bell ring. You can actually make it kind of jingle jangle if you just if you press it inconsistently. That's kind of something I appreciate, by the way, um, is being able to do that. Nate says that bell brings back a lot of memories. Yeah, what's really cool is is uh, when Preston made this game, he was able to record a lot of the, the sounds with clean audio. So these aren't simulated sounds. These are literally recordings that he was able to break up and use. So when you press the bell, that is quite accurately the bell from the CK Holiday slash EP Ripley, because they have the same bell. So that's quite literally the same. When you hear the Mark Twain whistling, that was recorded from the Mark Twain prior to its whistle replacement. Mark Twain has a new whistle now, which it sounds close to what it used to, but not the same. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, and the whistle of the CK Holiday is also recorded from the CK Holiday. So it... Uh, sounds accurate. So there's a lot of accurate sounds. Even the sounds that you're hearing, a lot of them were recorded from the engine. It's not one track playing a whole bunch of sounds. It's a whole bunch of isolated tracks playing together, which is what gives you this complex sound. And that's really important because when you run a steam locomotive, you need to listen to it. You need to be able to, to listen to it and hear if something's happening. Because, uh, you know, if, if this atomizer is hissing too much, you know there's too much air going through it, or steam going through it. Um, that kind of thing, you know, and Ite was, was talking about the thundering noise. You know, that thundering noise can indicate how, you know, how much 
atomizer you're using. So all that is really important, you know. If I click this, he recorded that sound from the Disneyland Railroad. You know, with no air brake pressure, basically the thing that's keeping this engine stopped up is uh, the Johnson bar at center. With the Johnson bar at center, it prevents the train from really being able to roll anywhere. But at Disneyland, if there's no air brake pressure in the system, what they will do is they will put chocks under the wheels to prevent it from rolling, just as a secondary measure. Is the injector this is how we get water into the boiler because when the boiler is pressured up you can't just open a hatch and pour water in to refill it, it it's pressurized you'll make it explode if you open it so um, so the way that you have to do it is you have to inject water using steam from the boiler so what this is is it's I'll turn on my flashlight it's a valve on the left here is the water supply line that comes from the tender, tenders back here. And using a, a hose, it connects to this pipe. So when you open this, water will come into this valve. And then if you open this, then steam will flow from the boiler from the top. Uh, let's see, that hose comes from the top of the steam manifold. So it comes down, sorry, I'm, I forget sometimes how to move this camera. The, the steam comes down, forces downward on the water, and it goes through a very complex valve. It's, it's a cone-shaped valve. So when the steam pressure goes through the cone, it actually increases its velocity and pulls the water with it. And that's what injects water into the boiler. And um, and so that's how they do it. That's how they refill this. Now, this is just the Disneyland trains. Um, in real life, there was another type of system which was used more often. And it was a injector. So there would have been a brass device about right here. You can see them at the Walt Disney World trains. There would have been a brass device around here and it would have been connected to the cylinder piston and so as the cylinder piston moved in and out, it moved a little piston of the brass device. And the brass device was a water injector. So as the piston moved back and forth, it forced water from the water injector into the boiler using just pure brute strength. And that's the, the type of injector they used more often um, in real life. Uh, the one at Disneyland is a steam injector because it's, it's, um, it's more efficient. Uh, you can fill the boiler faster. Now that's not to say that there's anything wrong with a, you know, a cylinder injector. Um, it's just that with a cylinder injector, you can only refill the boiler when the engine is moving. Because if the cylinder's not moving, you can't inject the boiler with water, which means that before you come in for a station stop, you better make sure you top up the boiler <laughs> with the right amount of water. Um, at Disneyland, they don't have to worry about that because they have the water injector. And they can operate the water injector whether they're sitting still or, or they're moving, it doesn't matter. Um, at Disney World, they use the cylinder injector and yeah, they have to monitor the water level very closely because if something goes wrong, they can't inject water. Robert says, Alex on the high iron. Yeah, exactly. We're still waiting for the pressure to build. Like I said, sometimes... Sometimes 
you can like get up real close and you can see if the needle's moving. I don't see it moving. Couch says water injector or water pump seen and heard as both. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, water injector, water pump. I try to distinguish the two by calling this an injector and using the other one as like a pump. Like I call it a pump or I call it like a, a cylinder injector. Um, just because a lot of people haven't seen this type of water injector before. They're used to seeing the pumps. So. Now there are lights in this locomotive. If I flick this switch here, all the lights will turn on, but we'll run down the battery. So um, I don't want to use up the battery if I don't need to. Um, the battery is kept recharged using dynamos. Oh, there's the Mark Twain of the distance. Um, the battery is kept charged using dynamos underneath uh, the first car of the train. So I can't see it here, yeah. So underneath the first car of the train, the wheels are connected to dynamos and then those dynamos will keep the engine uh, battery charged up and that helps to keep the lights running. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> If you're still here, how long does it take you to steam up the engine, you know, to, let's say, 75 PSI, right where you can start using the appliances? Because I'm running out of time. I didn't think it would take this long. For some reason, I, I felt like I used to do this in half an hour. So for this, those just tuning in, the reason why it takes so long is because, you know, in real life, again, this is a, a big piece of metal, and before you can even boil the water, you got to get the whole thing hot enough to boil water, so the engine needs to heat up, and then once the water is boiling, it'll start building pressure, you have to wait for the pressure to build, so it's a process at Disneyland that takes about three hours, um, with a full-size locomotive, at full scale, it would probably take closer to four to five hours to do so. Ite says it takes him one to two hours. You're kidding me. Ite says I usually start warm or ready. Yeah, me too. I always start warm or ready. I never start from cold because I, I remember it used to take me a long time, but I, my memory is skewed because for some reason I thought it took me half an hour. But... Uh, Apparently, I was really, really wrong. So, you guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat because I don't have much time. I've only got less than 15 minutes left. So I'm actually going to cheat here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this menu. I'm going to set us to warm. What that'll do is that'll... That will turn everything back off again. But there will be 50 pounds of pressure in the boiler. And I can show you what it'll look like. It's the same process. It's just that we're skipping ahead to the point where we have 50 pounds of pressure in the boiler. So I'm going to skip ahead. So we're going to set to warm. So as you can see, you can hear the fire shut off. Everything is shut off. Um, the, the, the compressor that was sitting right here between the tracks is gone. But... We're now simulating what it's like for the engineers to come in early in the morning. The engine is still warm from the night before. There's still 50 pounds of pressure in there. So we're going to simulate it from here. Now, the first thing we need to do is now that we have pressure in here, we're going to open this 
This is the steam manifold, so this operates the appliances that will need to run the engine. You can hear that clicking sound of the steam manifold heating up and expanding. All right, now we are going to open this. This is the atomizer. We need the atomizer in order to spray fuel into the boiler. This is the blower, so I'm going to open that up as well so we can actually move air out of the boiler. We're going to open that. Okay. Let me think. I was told Frisco 4500. Yeah, yeah, those take a while. Okay, so now, let's see. Setup. I'm going to open the fuel. I'm going to open the blower a little bit. I'm going to open. There's the atomizer. I can see a little bit of flame in there. Let's light the firebox. There we go. Now, instead of using compressed air like we were just using minutes ago, we have 50 pounds of pressure in the boiler, which means that's enough to actually get the atomizer working. Now, I'm gonna, wait, no, I'm gonna, I wanna see what the fire looks like to make sure. Let's open this a bit more. smoke coming out. That should be good. Alright, now let's close that. Oh, it's not letting me lock it. Oh, because I have the menu up, that's why. There we go. You gotta remember, if you want to open or close this thing to unlock it, you need the this menu to be turned off, so... <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so now we have a fire on. We should start building boiler pressure fast enough. We need it at 75 PSI to start the appliances. If it's not at 75 PSI, the appliances won't work correctly. Um, and then to operate the engine, to get it rolling, we need it at 125 PSI. So from this point on, we are going to be... I'm actually going to increase the fire and the atomizer because we need to heat this engine up right quick. So again, just to recap, what we were doing with the air compressor before we had 50 pounds of pressure was instead of using steam pressure to atomize the fuel by spraying it into the firebox, we were using a, a compressed air umbilical to spray the fuel. Uh, we would have had to disconnect eventually. We would have had to disconnect from the um, from the air compressor and open up the steam valves to let steam take its place. So, all right, we're building pressure. Once you have the water boiling, the pressure builds relatively quickly. You know, because there's nowhere for that steam to go. It just takes a while to get the water boiling, that's all. Alright, come on. The bigger the fire, the hotter the fire, that's for sure. And I'm, I'm constantly looking out to look to see if I see smoke coming out because the, uh, the smoke can, uh, I'm going to, uh, are the cylinder cocks open? Yeah, they're still open. Okay. You can see the, the pressure is rising. And that clicking, tink, 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 that's a good sound. That means that the pressure is building.
So, again, this knob up here on the right, this is the um, atomizer. When that's fully open, the atomizer can operate. This over here is the blower. When that's fully open, the blower can, can operate. The center one is for the air compressor. Now, we have that still turned off because, again, we can't run the air compressor until we have at least 75 pounds of pressure in the system. gives you a new appreciation for what they do at Disneyland, you know? It's not, like, some people just go, oh, it's a theme park train. Like, they imagine it's some battery-powered thing that rolls around the park. It's a real steam train. And the other thing that Disneyland does that not a lot of um, theme park steam trains do is, is the sheer accuracy of it all. Remember, I was talking about the, uh, the journals. These are actual, like, replicated you know, 1800s journals before the, the invention of ball bearings, and they don't usually have that on theme park steam trains anymore. They use ball bearings. So the, the level of accuracy that Walt Disney had went for uh, was really fantastic, and, uh, and they still maintain that to this day. constantly adjusting the fuel level to be open more and more because I'm hoping the fire will get bigger and hotter and we'll get this thing pressurized faster. In fact, we might even be able to set a... no, not that one. Is it number, no, it's number four. F4. for the automatic fireman, so that's the person that will get everything running for you while the... But the, but the train has to be operating. I, I haven't noticed whether or not the fireman can actually start the engine up from cold. I don't think he can. I think you have to do that. But once the engine is running, you can, you can activate the fireman by having him run the injectors, the firing, and the bell. Um, this allows it so you basically only have to run the train and make sure it stays lubricated. That's about it, you know. And the fireman can be either a woman, which is named Lauren, or a man named Mike. And you can adjust their expertise. I don't like them to be perfectly expert because yeah, it makes it more interesting when they don't keep the, the pressure at the, you know, target amount. It's kind of fun when when they're, they're adjusting and trying to get the pressure to stay, because that's more accurate. You know, if they were super, super expert, um, it wouldn't be an interesting train ride. So, we're almost at 75, and we'll start running the appliances. See, there's a little smoke coming out the stack, so that means I can open the atomizer just a little tiny bit. Too much. A little bit more. I'm just barely nudging the atomizer like a hair, just not that much. We just don't want to see smoke coming out the stack. Almost there, you guys, and then we'll start up the um, the thing. So 
So while we do that, what I'll do is, you see this this black line? It kind of disappears when we, if we go up to, see how it disappears? That's that's more accurate. You can kind of see the, you know, but but uh, but if you go down a bit, all of a sudden it shows up. This allows you to see how much oil is in the oiler. And so it's perfectly full. We don't need to worry about that. Um, this oiler will prevent the um, air compressor from seizing up. So what we'll do is when we're ready and we're ready to start running steam through here, we'll open this valve and this valve. This, this lets steam from the manifold into the oiler and, it'll, um, and it will go up through the oiler carrying some of the lubricant with it and come back down into the steam uh, pipe which will go directly to the compressor and supplying it with a little bit of atomized lubricant to prevent it from seizing up. And when we do that, you'll see that this, this nut here, this brass nut, it has to be turned ever so slightly, not even a quarter turn, not even an eighth of a turn, just slightly less than an eighth of a turn counterclockwise. Or is it clockwise? It's facing down. Clockwise, I guess. Just a tiny bit of a turn clockwise. All right, what are we at? We're almost at 75. We'll call it. We'll do. We'll start opening up the uh, the compressor. Now the compressor is operating. We'll open this up a little bit. See, not even that much. We'll open this valve. We'll open this valve. And there we go. The compressor will start getting oiled up. I'm also going to close the air, compre the air compressor line just a little bit because it's using up all our steam <laughs> that we just built up. So it'll run slower now. Now, in real life, you should be able to see the piston move up and down, but only barely, and so therefore in the game you can't see it move. Um, but you, you wouldn't really be able to see it that much anyway, not unless you're standing up right next to it. Now, not all of this coming out the stack is smoke. When it's puffing like that, that's steam. And that's steam exhaust from the air compressor. And you can see the fire flicker each time the steam compressor uh, is forcing, is using up steam. And then every time it exhausts the steam uh, and it creates a draft through the firebox, you're seeing the fire flicker. So the fire is flickering as the steam is creating a draft through the system. Isn't that amazing? says the pressure set button is an F1. Yeah. Yeah, I know my lubricator valves were off. I, I turn them on after I start the compressor. Maybe I should do it before, I don't know, but I just I just I usually do it afterwards. Keep the supply and exhaust drains open. Really? I don't feel like I can actually open the fuel a bit more. All right, folks, I do have to get going now. I have actually reached the end of my limit. Um, but that is basically it. I mean, 
There's a button that unlocks the throttle so you can actually move the engine. Of course, you can only move the engine when it reaches 125 PSI. Um, but that is essentially it. So the engine is running, the air compressor is operating. There is one more thing. Um, this, this, con this valve down here, this little knob, let me, flashlight, there we go. This little knob here controls the, um, the blowdown valve. The blowdown valve is necessary because when you get going, um, eventually with all that boiling water, it'll leave, uh, as the steam boils away, it'll leave sediments from the water that'll collect at the bottom of the boiler. You need to clear those sediments eventually. And, uh, and so for that, you need the, the blowdown valve to be open. The blowdown valve operates off of air pressure. So when you open this, you can actually pull this knob and you can actually blow, you know, blow uh, steam out the, um, the engine. And um, yeah, that's, as far as I'm aware, that's pretty much it. You can see the the boiler pressure is is building very slowly. The air pressure is at 40 pounds per square inch. The red needle marks how much air is applied to the brakes. There's none right now, but there are 40 pounds of of uh, of air brake pressure, which it will rise to 80. Uh, but there's not enough steam to run the compressor right now because it's only at 50. PSI. But um, that's basically it, folks, and that is how you get a, an engine, um, you know, heated up. All right, I do have to get going. I didn't think it would take this long for some reason. I was just an idiot. But yeah, that's how we do it, folks, and thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.